Welcome back to the Just Us show on Thursday the 29th. Thanks for joining us. Have music already. I'm just going to play one short track to get hold of my special guest for the evening, which is James Patrick. James is a former Met Police officer. He's also a whistleblower who's gone from revealing certain things in the Met that were hard to reveal, um, linked to corruption, um, ending up almost, well, I think he said he was a bankrupt on, on one of the pieces I read, and now writing an, a, a novel, so becoming an author for the first time with his, um, with his first book, and that's just out at the present time. And it's self-published from a small uh, publication house. It's called Forever Completely. So he'll tell us a bit about all that and more when I come back with a with a, a chance for you to speak to him. I have got, also got some advanced questions for him from outside, for members of the public. Some of those questions are, um, yeah, d- challenging. I think they're going to be different different kind of questions, not not your typical questions that you would normally get. I think for him, or or even f- that I'm used to him in, because um, sometimes like yeah, people people pay more mainstream. They ask more mainstream. So yeah, I'm going to get hold of him. Oh, hold on a minute. Uh, is that you now, James? Are you on the phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, uh, since you're here already, we may, we may as well just get straight on with the conversation. Because okay. I, I can see that it's already uh, 908 and time will go very quickly with this one. Okay. How are you this evening? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? I'm not too bad at all. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you fine. That's great. Okay. Um, James? Yes. Can you please just tell us a bit about yourself and what you used to do? Sorry, say say that one more time. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? A bit about I know because yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, of course. Cause I know because I, I follow you. Yeah, I, I was a I was a policeman for ten years. I worked um, I worked first in Derbyshire Police and then at the Met. Um, I ended up being a specialist analyst based at the Emperor State Building in Scotland Yard. Um, I uncovered some fiddling of the crime figures, um, <coughs> tried to raise the issues internally, and uh, met with a bit of resistance, shall we say. So I ended up sparking a parliamentary inquiry into crime figures, um, which which was led by the Public Admin Select Committee in 2013, and ended up with police national crime figures being stripped of their status as a national statistic. Um, I was then, for all intents and purposes, hounded out of the job. Yeah, how, how were you hounded? Can you mind telling us a bit more? Yeah, um, there are a lot of issues within policing. Um, and if you raise an issue which is perhaps unpalatable, um, or raise a conversation topic which the upper echelons don't really like, you're going to be met with things like discipline. I was met with discipline for publicly raising concerns over um, reforms to policing. Um, so I was put on restricted duties, banned from talking to the public. Um, I was subjected to pretty much a year and a half's worth of gross misconduct investigation, which they dropped in the end um, because there was just no way it was it was going anywhere. Um, but then behind the scenes, there are the insidious little things they tend to do, which is um, it's, it's fairly standard for a lot of whistleblowers. It's the um, HR approach. It's the trying to manage you out of the job changing your roles, putting you in um, meaningless positions, uh, just constantly being over your shoulder. Um, so at the end of the day, I knew I knew when I went to Parliament that my days were going to be numbered in policing, but I made a very conscious decision that, that doing the right thing came before my career at the time. So I, uh, I did what I did. I'm very proud of what I did because it means that victims of crime now get a much better service than they did previously especially for serious offences like sexual offences um and i'm i'm sort of free of the uh free of the grief that comes with that well listen we we, the public applaud you james because it takes a very strong person to stand up to the system it takes a very strong person in the system to stand up to the system and that when you do that you end up knowing that you have no friends because there's nobody going to be with you did you find that yeah, it was it was peculiar, really, because obviously at the time I had um, I'd built up quite a strong following on Twitter. That's that's half of how I I, I sort of managed to get through. Um, and while there are a lot of a lot of people behind the scenes who were very very supportive of me, who were um, sort of in my corner, and I, I felt the sort of the emotional support of it. 
um, in in the day to day life, in my day to day life, when I was I was there and I was doing this, I was I was on my own um, because people can't be there to hold your hand, and people they can't risk their own careers, um, they, they can't risk their own families um, and their own security to 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 sort of stand with you. Um, so it was it's a really really peculiar set of circumstances, and it's an incredibly lonely place to be as well. It must be. So have you, how have you kept mentally strong, if you don't mind me asking? Because it, that must be very taxing on your mental strength. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It was awful. Um, the, the, the sort of the lasting effects of it, um, I'm still coping with them now. Because it's just, it's, it's a crushing weight. Um, it's a crushing weight because not only do you know what you're doing, you're going against people who are in much more significant positions of power than you you've still got to go do your job be as professional as you can be while the rug is being pulled out from under you but at the same time you are causing hurt to your family because the 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 ultimately the punch is coming you're going to lose your secure job you're going to lose your secure career being a whistleblower it leaves you well how can i put this it, it leaves you pretty much unemployable in anything decent because every big organisation has got a skeleton in its closet right. and they take one look at you and they think, if we've got a skeleton and this guy finds it, he's going to do the same thing again. Um, so no, nobody nobody will entertain that. So in terms of the, the emotional support, it, it pretty much nearly destroyed me and I, I drank. I've, I've never lied about this to anybody. Right. Um, I became really quite introverted. I wouldn't talk to to a great deal of people because I was left with massive trust issues. Um, and the sort of the emotional damage, I'm still unpicking large swathes of that now. It's it's been um, it's been horrendous, to be honest. And then then the, the financial toll because you've lost your salary and you had to pay. Is it out for for legal advice and support? There, there was there was. There's all sorts that goes on. I mean, I've, I I had at the time um, a wife and two young kids to support. Right. So when when I left the job, I left with nothing. And obviously you're left in this uh, unemployable void. You're very much in the public eye. Um, so I ended up doing, I think, minimum wage bar work. Um, I eventually, I managed to, at great personal cost, uh, pull in um, some sort of like private finance and I managed to open a country pub in the end um, renovated it did all the hard work and then uh, out of the blue there was a four month road closure um, which directly impacted the business I mean the road outside the business was closed um, so I ended up being bankrupted in March this year oh, no. and just just the pressures of everything at the end of the day the, the marriage which had been under strain for a very long time um, finished. Um, the impact on the kids has been quite significant. Um, and at first, I, I, I sort of I came out of the job, and I believed that I would still be capable of, of even representing myself at an employment tribunal because you don't get federation funding when you go. Right. Um, but when you're confronted with uh, not just one but two barristers, and they play it on a purely procedural basis rather than facts um, I, I had to walk away from that because I just realised that I was pretty much human scrap at the time when I left the job and to try and fight that battle any further without the support of anything it was just going to be it was going to be a nightmare But now that you've actually experienced what everyday citizens go through really as a, as a matter of fact and some of them go through that when they feel that they're on the receiving end of the police process from the police themselves. Can you relate more, and would you do anything to help help that? Yeah, I mean, I I I, I come from um, I'm not from a from a rich or even middle class background. My my background is is what it was. I was born in a council house. I was brought up with two brothers who were constantly in trouble with people who were constantly in trouble. All my best friends um, from when I was growing up, they are. Um, a lot of them have gone on to have some very unfortunate circumstances. I was lucky. Um, I was very lucky. I was very lucky because I walked away at the age of 19 
and I went to live in Paris for a little bit, otherwise I'd have had a very different future. So <clears throat> I've always had a level of of understanding of how real life works, of, uh, uh, of how things can be, but I made a very conscious choice that I wanted to try and help people from within policing. So a lot of my attitude has never changed. Um, but now that I'm outside of it, it's very, very easy for me to see where, or, 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 or perceive where the flaws in police culture are in a slightly more glaring basis than before, because I was trying to balance the books on both sides, right. trying to take the perception of the public and do everything properly by them, which is what I effectively did with the parliamentary inquiry thing. It was about the value of people coming to the police and being able to rely on the police. Um, but also, policing itself can be quite defensive, and within that environment, it feels almost justified that you stick up for a lot of it because you feel like you're under a lot of pressure, you feel like you're um, being asked more of you than there actually is to give on many occasions. So it's quite a complex, it's quite a complex thing. And looking at it from outside, the, the complexities of it now probably strike me harder um, than they ever did before. And I, I look at things like Twitter, and I look at... I mean, I've talked to you on Twitter quite a few times, and we've talked about events as they've unfolded. And me and you have quite a similar view mm -hmm. in terms of a lot of stuff. We'll react in very much the same way, and we'll be horrified at the same things. And um, what I've noticed is that Within policing, there are some people who react in that way. There are some people whose immediate response is, it's just another dig at the police. It's just another dig at the police. Mm -hmm. And it's this, it's almost um, like watching frontline troops who've just been constantly shelled and expecting them to, to react in a different way. Because the front line guys, they are under an immense amount of pressure. Immense amounts of pressure. And this, this is one thing I think in, in, in terms of the broader public, which is not understood. The, the demands which are placed on front line police officers are off the scale in terms of emotional demands, in terms of the things that they see. And it skews the view, but it also creates this barrier to communication that, that me and you both witness quite frequently. It does, but isn't that down to an individual way of responding, or do you think it's about the, the service itself from the corporate strategic <laughs> angle? I, I think there are many, many, many flaws in strategic leadership of policing. Um, I think the, the best recent example is, is on spit hoods. Yes, yes. I don't like um, I'm not, not keen on. I'll, no, I mean... I'll, I'll be frank, I am not a massive fan of the idea of, um, from a public perception point of view, seeing people have a bag put over their head. Right. The, the connotations of that on their own, they are absolutely horrendous. And statistically, I, I think I was one of the only people who ever sat down and tried to work this out. The level of, um, of need is so poorly established but it works out as, as it, it, it would be an impact on less than sort of point, I think it's point zero zero nine percent of the London population that would require the deployment of a spit hood if you look at the Met's own figures. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the same time, nobody, nobody should be spitting at police officers. No, no, no. I mean, no, the, no. these guys are just trying to do a job, mm -hmm. right? They all want to go home safe to their, to their families at the end of the day. Nobody wants hepatitis. Nobody wants HIV. That, that heart-stopping moment where you get um, an infected prisoner and they've bled on you or bled into a cut or spat in your face, it is, it is horrifying because the impact potentially is your life. Mm -hmm. But from the strategic point of view, like the College of Police in response to this debate on spit hoods, they didn't come out and say, look, what we need to do is explain to people how spit hoods work when they're going to be deployed, how they're going to be controlled, what they're actually for, which some of the police bloggers actually took on and, and ran with, and they did a really good job on it. Um, but the college basically said, well, it's just an operational decision. We want nothing to do with it. 
Now, these are the people who are supposed to be giving national guidance, who are supposed to be the bridge between policing and the public, who are supposed to set the policies which are right for everybody. And all, all they did effectively was wash their hands. And that is just a symptom of this absolute abject failing in strategic police management. And it actually lets everybody down. Because it, it means there is no filter on these arguments. It means that the when you get a situation like Spithoods, there is no sensible debate or sensible conversation. There's a, a very polarised view, and there is nobody to step in in the middle and sort things out and sort of find the common ground and work out how to work together to, to get it right. But from it's, public, it's horrendous. Well, yeah, it is horrendous, but it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm all for Spithoods if people were spitting at the police all the time. But it's, mm. it's a very rare thing for people to spit. They, they, the police more or less know those people that might spit at them. And unfortunately, those people actually get charged with assault when you spit at an officer, so they're less likely to do it the next time around, surely. I don't know. But the, yeah. the experience is, is, is vile. I, I know it condone people spitting at police officers, but I don't yeah. see that as a normal, everyday thing. I've been to plenty of um, protest no. demos and custodies. <laughs> This for me, Sandra, this mm -hmm. is the point. I mean, in terms of the spit of the issue, statistically, as far as I can see, there isn't a great deal of support for it. No. It's not, no. It's not a preemptive thing, mm -hmm. right? Because the, the very action is by the time somebody's spitting, they've already spat. So why, put, why, why do it, right? There, there, is, there is no point to it. Statistically, it's such a, a marginal um, occurrence that... The, the need for it isn't justified on stats alone. But it's very, very indicative of the type of failing in strategic argument or strategic leadership. Because what the Met effectively did is under the table said, well, we're doing this. And then you saw what happened when the Mayor's Office met and they said, well, why are we doing this? Right. Who's yeah. told us about this? Where's the consultation? And what this ends up with is all of a sudden you've got the, the the front line police officers who've been told they're having this piece of protective equipment have suddenly been told they're not having it without it being explained to them because there is no strategic leadership which is saying to them look guys actually this is what we need to do this is what we should be doing and at the same time that same strategic leadership has failed to even consult with the mayor's office and that tells you everything that you need to know about uh, about a lot of the the mid-level and management level failures in policing. It's an, just a complete failure to digest and think and think more broadly about the consequences of everything. And actually, it's a huge barrier to engagement because what it does, it creates this sort of divisive feel straight away where the public are going to think, well, the Met just wanted to put bags on people's heads and the frontline coppers who haven't been given the opportunity to, to have the debate properly themselves as well, are going to be sat there going, well, the public just want people to spit at us. And it's just, it creates this failure, this this complete breakdown, which is the antithesis of everything that policing should be. It, it, it does seem that way. And unfortunately, the, the end experience is that the public have less confidence in what the police are doing at the current time. They're, they're trying mm. to find their way through the UK police maze. And although the service is, is good in part when it works well, and you have some effective services, I mean, some forces are, are effective throughout. Then you've got others mm. that the Met obviously is seen as a bit of a shambles most of the time for us. Yeah, the Met is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then and then you've got Bedfordshire where, where I am, and that, that has good parts and bad parts for the experiences of the people around the service. When things go wrong, they go horribly wrong and they have to try and relearn. And they, but people hate it when people, the police say they're learning again from the same mistake. They don't like that. They think that yeah. you, you should learn the first I mean, the, the, the whole thing is, right, if you keep saying we're going to learn from a mistake, we're going to learn from a mistake, and then you carry on making the same mistake, mm -hmm. your credibility is shot to pieces. Right. There, there is no credibility, is there? Because all, all you see from a broader point of view, and I see it as a member of the public now, um, is, well, the police got this wrong. They're still getting this wrong. They haven't learned anything. So the next time I hear them say that there was a mistake and they've learned something, how can I believe it? How can I believe it? And that's that's the that's the the biggest mountain that people have got to to climb within policing is 
is organisational learning is a failure. Evidence-based policing is going a long way to trying to address these issues, but it's not a golden bullet. But this must be it's the first still not a golden bullet. Right. This must be the first time opportunity of this type of conversation with an ex-police officer of its kind, because you're obviously Caucasian, white, um, not middle class, but middle class now because you've moved into middle class bracket, I've got to say, James. I was, yeah. I was actually born black middle class in Luton for my sins in the 50s when you wouldn't have expected yeah. a black person to be born in the middle classes but my father had his own house and he had a building company of his own and he employed people at the time and yeah. basically so the perceptions were that uh, I was not a stereotypical child of the time but basically yeah. my, so my experiences of policing with the, I, I was always treated with a lot of respect and didn't have yeah. I was not really getting into trouble I've never known anybody in my circle that was arrested and so until I joined the independent advisory group I didn't really have knowledge of anybody in custody that had a had a bad experience. Yeah. But now, of course, uh, I've had 14 years around the police as an IAG, but I've left that role. I retired in April, but I'm seeing more and more um, issues and complaints and concerns about policing than I've ever seen before. Yeah. Yeah, and th- this is this is half the problem. If you, if you take a look at the the broader world that we live in now, it's fractious. It's tense. We're, we're we're living right through the middle of a tinderbox, mm-hmm. and policing is one of those rare microcosms of it, where, where all the symptoms of everything which is wrong are displayed. And say like Brexit, mm-hmm. okay? There's this huge increase in hate crime, not generated by by the police, not generated by the people that me and you know, or even the, the do you know what I mean? The mm-hmm. people in general. Mm-hmm. But it's peddled and pushed by politicians in the media to create these divisions. And these divisions then end up being confronted by people who are marginalised by the the political and the media approach, which is always, always black and ethnic minorities. Always is. Always is. And this generates an immediate friction. Right. The people who then are on the immediate receiving end of this are the police. So all of a sudden you've got friction and you've got a point of contact between the establishment and the same people who are being marginalised. And this is, this, is where, this is where the conflict becomes very real because for a lot of people this is their first and only experience. Because a lot of people don't... Can, can you hold that thought though, please, James, because we're going to go to a, a quick three-minute break... And- Welcome back to the Just Us show. It's Thursday, 29th, as I said, and yes, September is almost over. We are live on air with a, 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 a former police officer from the Metropolitan Police, that's the London Police, with a massive uh, staff of, I forget how many thousands. James, are you still with us? I am still here. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know how many thousands at the current time, the est- estimate that the um, Met Police Force has? Um, it's still, it sticks around the 32,000 mark, I think. 32,000 officers to the 1,200 that we have here in Bedfordshire. That's that's huge, isn't it? Huge. Yeah, it's massive. It's mm. massive. It's the it's the same differential, really. I mean, I started off my career in Derbyshire, and I, I think we, we were very, very similar to, to beds at the time, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200. Um, the challenges are no different, right, but, but right. The, the sheer numbers in the Met are incredible. So manoeuvring your way through the Met must have been a, a, a shock for you in itself. Yeah. It it was it was interesting. It was interesting. I mean, coming from coming from Derbyshire, which I I, I massively respect as a police force, um, we we dealt with no resources, with a huge demand and a huge level of professionalism, which I know that a lot of the county's forces do. I came into this. I, I initially went to Camden, and what I was confronted with was an over resourced, but um, very, very, from my perspective, under professionalised workforce, and the solution seems to be in the Met. Just throw numbers at stuff. Right, right. So you had loads of offices, but not enough structure, and perhaps. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the the thing is, I, I think, I think the the big difference for me, it's it's the enforced training, it's the structure of the way that people are are brought out from their probation onto the streets and. It's just this, it was always this approach of 
if we just throw numbers, throw bodies at a problem, the problem will disappear. Mm. And that that's just something that was so alien to me, because when you've got when you've got no or, or a very limited number of police officers facing very very similar levels of demand, um, you just have to police smarter. You have to police more politely. You can't afford um, the mistakes because the the scrutiny is almost like um, the effect of a microscope because you're not a big fish. In, you, you're not um, you're not a small fish in a big pond. Right. You're, you're very very sort of visible. It's like looking at a shark in a goldfish bowl. So, corrupt police officers and police officers engaged in malpractice show themselves up very very quickly in the smaller forces. Yes, I'm sure they are. that would probably be the case anyway. And the same as a firm, because yeah. in a corporate yeah. firm you can always they, they seem to catch them out quicker if it's a smaller firm too. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean. Professional standards departments, they do have um, significant issues across the country. I was reading about um, uh, the Chief Inspector's report into Police Scotland today, um, which which makes for very, very interesting reading. I'll very I'd recommend that, that everybody goes away and Googles it. I'll bookmark that one to read sometime in the yeah. next couple of days or so. But before we get too much further on, because unfortunately there's only 25 minutes left, can you believe it, James? We've been talking for 35 minutes already almost. Blimey. But, so this is James Patrick People. He is a, a former PC. He's gone from whistleblower to writer. And we've got to talk about his Forever Completely book too, because you've got to go out and support him by buying it. But before we get to that, and I'll talk about that in the next 10 minutes, I've got two or three questions that come in from the public, and he's agreed that they're quite pertinent and interesting questions. So the first quest- are, yeah. yeah, so the first question, um, James, is um, what do you think of um, the, the, the support that's given to black and, uh, and Asian and uh, other minority police officers in the force, do they get enough support when they have an issue and they have to raise an issue of discrimination from the other officers? Do you know, I, because of where I first worked, if you'd have asked me this question in 2009, mm-hmm. before October 2009, I'd have said yes. I'd have said everybody is supported properly i'd have said that the structure in um in derbyshire constabulary was more than sufficient and actually really really professional really tailored really experienced to shut down problems and provide everybody support the staff groups were fantastic the the structure of it was incredible what I've learned since since leaving the Met, um, in particular recently, because there's been quite a few articles about this. There's an article in the Evening Standard which caused a bit of a furor. Um, oh, still, absolutely woeful, woeful. Um, I don't. The, the strange thing is, if you look, if you were to look at it on paper. And you would see the support groups and the meeting groups and the the acronyms and the accessible services for people. You'd probably, at a quick glance, say, yeah, well, they must be properly supported. But then you hear the stories behind what goes on. Um, and you hear you hear the attitude of, of um, who, who's the guy who's the deputy? Uh, Craig Mackey. Craig Mackey, even even recently when confronted with, uh, I think it was a discrimination case, he's he, he's made this very, very distinct line in the sand, which is, well, we accept no fault. We don't accept there is a problem. Um, this was just like a one-off case. It's not. It can't be because the cases are numerous. The cases are numerous. Look at, um, was it Carol Howard? I don't remember the name. Was, the other, um, I can't she, remember. Um, but, but oh, these, but that, that young black officer, you mean, that was last yeah. year? Yes, yes, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. of course, yeah. The, these, but these cases are numerous. The, these cases are numerous. And what it tells you if, you, if you take a step back from it, is that what you're looking at, back in the McPherson report, one of the things um, Sir McPherson wrote about the Met, and about the Met leadership in particular, was that they had a lot of fine words and policies but they weren't necessarily backed up by substance. Mm -hmm. And as I was just saying, if you looked at it on the face of it, you would think, right, support groups, all these facilities, everything must be excellent. 
But the more evidence that comes out, it just it echoes of McPherson. It just echoes of fine words and policies, but no substance. No substance and absolute resistance at the level of leadership to, to deal with problems that they know exist. So, while years ago I'd have said, yeah, everything's fine, everything's adequate, I can't say that hand on heart now. I, I just can't. I can't say that the support is there and the support is right. That's not that's not very encouraging. And for those listening, they must be wondering, you know, because you, you've been in it. How, how many years again were you in it for? I, um, well, I was in the service for 10 years. I was in the Met for five. That's a long time. Um, long, long enough to get to grasp and to grips with how, every, how things are really done. It wasn't a, a short career. It was, no, it was, no, not at all. And in particular, where I worked. Mm -hmm. um, in, in particular, with the exposure I had to the... the um, process reviews and the high level analysis stuff which which included staffing which included um breakdowns of of um black and ethnic minority groups which it just included everything right. it included everything so I've, I've got quite a broad breadth of experience in this and hand on heart i just can't say that that whatever is being done is working properly so the second question was about the um, the networks. Do you think the networks are in place to support the, a minority representation inside the police force today? Again, it, it, it boils down it boils down very much to the same thing. If you were to look at it on paper and look at all the the systems and facilities and and groups and policies and procedures, you would probably say, yeah. You would probably say, yeah. But, again, it comes down to lack of substance. There is something within it which is grating and groaning away like a machine which is about to collapse. It's this fine words and policy thing. And I do not, I, I, can't, I can't hand on heart tell you that I think the networks are right. The same as I can't tell you that the support is right. It's just, there's something very, very wrong. There's something very wrong. And at the moment, it's... It's beyond my capability to, to poke my nose in and have a, a prod around, which would be my, my preference, but I'm not a copper anymore. No, there are people who are, and they should be. But you could have done so much more to help to improve it, from even from the outside now in, because from what you're saying, you've been very candid and you've been very kind in sharing. Thank you so much. But you've actually given us an insight that we've not really had from anybody before. I, I, think, I think realistically... Um, the, the the chance of, of of me being able to help now is slim, um, but I, I do intend in the very near future to write to to Sadiq Khan um, and just just offer him um, the help and assistance which is available from myself and from other officers like me. There, there's a few great guys out there. There's another whistleblower, Frank Matthews. We're very passionate and caring about the same issues, and the the mayor's office, certainly in London alone, could do with the external oversight. And I think with the coming change of leadership, um, it would be a good time to perhaps listen to some outside voices, some possibly dissenting voices who are going to have conversations that people might not like, but right. are more than required. Yeah, people don't like conversations that I bring to the table sometimes and it makes you feel a bit um, uncomfortable because they make you feel like you shouldn't bring anything up. I hate when people say to me, oh, we wouldn't expect you in your position to be saying that. You're like, who gave me any position and who are you to judge? You know, I get that. You notice I've got that on Twitter sometimes. People say, yeah. why, why are you saying that with your position, Sandra? We wouldn't expect that from you. And you're like, who are you? You're not the judge, please. <laughs> why I should say no. something or not say it, you know? Uh, and, and this is this is the crazy thing, right? If if you've got a concern, if you've got a concern, you should, you must be able to raise it. You shouldn't you shouldn't hear this this kickback, this feedback. You shouldn't be bitten for for raising a concern or raising an issue. Um, and I, I just think sometimes that the mechanisms are so skewed, and it's the same across the world. It's the same, it's the same in. It's the same in health services. It's the same in the NHS. It's the same everywhere. You look at the stories of, uh, of whistleblowers. You look at all of these stories across the world, and this goes back all the way in time to, to the big and famous ones like Frank Serpico and the NYPD. Right. 
Mm-hmm. They've experienced the same kickback, the same push. You raise a concern, somebody somewhere is going to get unnerved by it. When, when I started raising the issues about crime figures, it was denied. Like, the first reaction of, of um, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe was to say, no, no, we do everything properly. It, it's ever so funny. I tweeted this earlier on. It was only it was only two weeks later that he was forced to admit that, that what I'd said was a truth that needed to be heard. And this was in part because Lord Stevens, one of the previous commissioners, had come out and said that the manipulation of crime figures had been going on since he joined the job, which I believe at that time I was probably not even wearing nappies. Right, right. So the, these things, these kickbacks, by the years that have passed, people should be over it and they're not they're not and that just shows you how little how little has actually changed and and dissenting voices are actually often the most valuable ones that you have access to well look before you go any further with that thought i must just first of all ask you people the last question has come from somebody who really wants to know a bit about how police deal with racism and um You've got a, a black man, he's only five foot tall, he's only a, a build of a size eight woman, he's driving yeah. around in his car, he's doing, there's a stop and search coming, and the police you know, stop him and approach the car, and they, they order him out, he gets out of the vehicle, and they tackle him, rugby tackle him, as though he's 200 pounds in weight, six foot four in build, and unfortunately yeah. ends, it ends up with something that could go wrong or has gone wrong. Why do, yeah. why do police forces in Britain feel they have to bring extra aggression, it feels like that to the black community, to the table when there's a black man or even some of a black woman involved? It's, I mean, that's a, I'll say this now, that's, that's a horrendous story and it just sounds, even with you just saying the words, to anyone with, with a conscience, it just sounds imbalanced disproportionate that's straight off the bat i i i I can't answer on that individual case exactly what's happened but what i can say not all police officers are good coppers not all police officers are good coppers sometimes they're just bad bad apples sometimes there is this strange group mentality thing um which is a unique thing to policing Sometimes there is um, an overreaction. If you look at the video, I don't know, people have probably seen this. The guy smashing the car window? Yes, we've seen that. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at that. Now, the things which struck me about that straight away. Um, a, what was he doing? Why was he smashing that car window? What would have been wrong with actually talking to the guy? Right. Explaining why he'd been stopped? Mm-hmm. Right. So the default position is aggression. I noticed this in London more than anything else, and I'll, I'll explain something about that in a second. If I don't, please remind me. Um, but the interesting thing for me about that video was the other police officer, because he sat, he stood by the car. He was quite passive, wasn't he? Isn't everything it? that was happening, mm-hmm. and didn't do a thing. Didn't intervene didn't say to him, oh, come away, mate, just leave it for a second, we'll sort it out. He waited until this chap had had his window smashed and jumped out the side of the car. Then he started speaking to him. And that is, is either the the sign of someone who is very uncomfortable with the person that they're working with, or it's someone who is fundamentally complicit in what's happening. So it's a deeply disturbing watch, and it's indicative of, I don't know, I'd say a phenomenon of group psychology, um, which can occur in policing and, and has done in the past. Now, this thing that I wanted to come back to, and I keep rattling on about this, when I worked in Derbyshire, the way that I was trained is, use your mouth, talk yourself out of a situation, talk people out of violence, just talk to people, be a human, because it resolves 90% of situations without the need for anything further to happen. When I went to the Met, what I did notice is that the default position is very, very aggressive. Very aggressive. It's don't start at verbal. You start with um, a push or a shove or a grab, and you see it in stop searches. You see it in the 
level of aggression and the style of policing which is used. It's it's a peculiarity, and I've never been able to get to grips with how that's happened. But the strange thing was, when the London riots happened, and when the Olympics were on, and staff were called in from all over the country, all over the country to police London in all of its diverse and unique glory, afterwards people noticed the difference. They noticed the difference between the outside of London officers and the inside of London officers. Yeah, in that yeah. you could talk to, mm-hmm. you could talk to the Welsh police, you could talk to the Headley, you could talk to, you could talk to the Bedford cops, you could talk to the Derbyshire guys, you could talk to the South Yorkshire, and have a bit of banter. There were never any sort of like big bust ups or brawls or anything like that. And people felt much better. People felt much safer, and the level of public interaction was much nicer. Um, so there is, there is psychologically. There must be something, and it's about time that the, the College of Policing and some external groups started to explore exactly what it is that causes these levels of aggression, whether it's the, the teams are under too much pressure, whether it's the, the wearing effects of PTSD. Now, I can tell you PTSD does have an impact on you. Um, I've, I've been in some, some incredibly traumatic situations, fatal fires, um, uh, arrests of armed suspects for which I've been commended and they leave a legacy with you and it changes your approach to life to a degree but I don't think the service and this is now recognised because the superintendents have recognised it the well-being of staff the mental well-being of staff and the effects of the wear and tear of the job are not being properly addressed and I think in part that could well be responsible for a lot of the adverse behaviours which are occurring and again the responsibility for this it lies at a very high level because at the end of the day coppers are just humans same as everybody else yeah. you put people in bad situations mm-hmm. you put people in bad situations repeatedly and it's almost inevitable that behaviors are going to become ingrained that that people are always going to act and respond in a certain way especially if they're damaged especially if they're damaged mm-hmm. And for me, this is this is an absolutely crucial thing. The police service have long had time to get to grips with this, and they really need to, because okay. potentially that could be that could be the answer to the to the damage between relations. Well, it that could, could be what it is. Yeah, it could be. It could be. I mean, you're you're making a lot of sense here, and, and talking things that, that sound like why isn't someone doing something to fix all of this? And, and, make- and that's this is the thing. This is the thing. Why isn't somebody doing something to fix it? When you're talking about the welfare of officers, when I'm going to a gold command or a silver command meeting, I don't anymore, but I used to. Um, yeah. I spent 14 years in that environment, and the, of late, it just felt like the, the, for the senior officers, the welfare of the, the officers in the force was over and above the welfare of the people who were injured or hurt. And or even the death in custody, the case of the. So I'd often be sitting there saying, why isn't it more important to be looking at the person and the family? Why isn't it more important to be also looking and considering the reputation of the police force and putting that on your risk assessment? Why uh, isn't it more important to be doing? And I'd be the voice in the room saying those things, and people would be like looking at me, yeah. But but actually, it did get on the risk assessments, and it was part of the meeting. So I do feel my contribution at the times were valid. But, um, it yeah, no, seriously, right. Me, me and you should get together and have a chat off air about this because we could do some really productive stuff. Um, I, I think, I think, within policing as well, as well, and I've experienced this firsthand. There is still this this insidious reputation first um, reputation the force above everything else, right. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you look at it. You look at the historical quir- in, inquiries, like um, like Hillsborough. It's the shining example of this. Oh, what was that all about? Fundamentally, that was coming before the truth. That was about the potential lawsuits against the force, and the potential cost of those lawsuits, and the potential cost to senior leaders, leadership's jobs. Right. Um, and that was put above the truth and the duty to to the families in care and i genuinely think in a lot of the decisions that that are made 
and I, I know this was for a fact in, in the way that I was dealt with, is that the reputation of police forces is put above everything else, often purely for financial reasons. You look at, I don't, you might think the comparison's bonkers, but it's not. Big car companies and recalls, okay? They will only ever affect the recall of a defective motor vehicle if the cost of recalling the vehicles is less than the cost of potential lawsuits. Then right? we'll, then we'll so if, if it's going to cost them uh, less in paying out for deaths for damaged brake linings or something than it is to recall all the vehicles, they'll leave the vehicles out. I think somewhere in the corporate psychology of policing, the same sort of thing has occurred. And it, it's, again, one of these driving, driving forces and factors, and it's long overdue that it's looked into properly. Because otherwise, we're going through this hollow, we've learned, we've learned, we've learned from our mistakes thing. And this is why it's hollow. Because mistakes don't happen again and again and again and again over periods of years. They just mm -hmm. don't. It's not possible for patterns to repeat on that long a basis if they've been fixed. Well, somebody said if you've done it, if you've done it twice, it's no longer a mistake, it's on purpose. And I said, that's, that's a bit too deep. You don't want to think that a police force would make mistakes on purpose. But look, the last four minutes is upon us. And before I even go any further, we've got to hear a bit about your book. You've gone from whistleblower to writer, James. How did that yeah. manage? How did you get, get to that point? What is, what's with the book Forever Completely? What a lovely title. Um, right, basically, <laughs> um, after I went bankrupt, so I, I found myself living in... Uh, in, in a bed sit um, with uh, an alcoholic Scottish guy above me urinating on the ceiling every night. Um, yeah, no, it was lovely. I just sat there and used to wait for, for his bodily fluids to drip through the plaster. Um, so I, I chose um, to escape my circumstances um, by writing. I've always loved writing. Always loved writing. And I, I sat there for, for the first week um, in, the, in this basic shambles that was once upon a time in my life. Um, and this story came out, came out whole, came out complete. And it's, it's a story about, um, well, as silly as it may sound, um, lost love and the, the end of the world and um, people in, <laughs> zombies infected with, with rage and all the bad bits of human nature and then a bit of magic and a bit of love and a bit of redemption. And really what it was, it was a metaphor for, for my life as it was and my life as I want it to be. Um, so the book's out. It's available now. Um, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on iBooks. You can get it on Kindle. You can get it pretty much everywhere. It's, it's a little bit off the wall. People describe it as unique. Um, it was my escape. And if it can help other people to escape for a little bit of time, um, then, then, then I'll be a very, very happy man. Well, there's another book in you that needs to be a bit more factual and needs to be about the, the, the people's guide to policing. You need, you, you've got to think about that one, and, and if you can get round to, to penning another one, people will buy this book. I'll be putting it out myself that they should buy it to help you to rebuild as well because it's a rebuilding book. And if you want to help one person to rebuild, you deserve that chance. But basically, yeah. they, they, there's another book in you, James. There's a book where I can see you as a bridge between the people understanding the real McCoy of the police and the myth. And the PCC doesn't have that because they're not normally someone that's done a job for 10 years. So, no. So I, I'd, I'd like to think I'm going some way to addressing this. I, I've got um, what is effectively my policing memoir is being edited now. That's going to be out on the 19th of November. Good. Um, yeah. It's going to be called The Rest is Silence. And it's not a collection of blogs. It's the story of everything that, that happened from when I arrived in the Met to, to my, my departure after the parliamentary inquiry. And I hope people find it useful to read and, if nothing else, enlightening. And in the meantime... Um, forever completely is just a massive piece of escapism. Well, we're going to put both of those out. It's been a total joy talking to you, although horrific, a horrific joy. But to have you share the time, I really can't thank you enough. We're, not, we're, we're about to go off air because it's the end of the show, but we'll catch up with you again <laughs> soon. I'll give you a call off air, but I want to thank you so much and have a wonderful evening, James. Thank you. Thank you. You too. I'll speak to you very soon. Take thank care. You. Bye bye. And then we'll stay, stay on the line.